South Carolina ETV, South Carolina Public Radio, and The Post and Courier are co-presenters of this program. Good evening and welcome to the 2018 South Carolina Lieutenant Governor's Debate, coming to you live from the SCE-TV studios here in Columbia, South Carolina. I'm Charles Bierbauer. Joining me tonight to question the candidates is Andy Shane of The Post and Courier. Election Day is now just eight days away, and for the first time, the candidates for lieutenant governor are running on the same ticket as the candidates for governor. Those candidates are Pamela Evett, who is running with Henry McMaster on the Republican ticket, and Mandy Powers Norell, who is running with James Smith on the Democratic ticket. Before we begin our usual ground rules, candidates, you'll have the opportunity to make a one-minute opening statement. After that, you'll have one minute to respond to our questions. Uh, as needed, I'll allow 30-second rebuttals. We drew for places in starting order when the candidates arrived this evening, so Pamela Evett, we will begin with your opening statement. Thank you. Thank you to SCETV for hosting this debate tonight, and thank you to all of you for tuning in. I'm Pamela Evett, and I'm the Republican candidate for Lieutenant Governor. I'm honored to be running with our governor, Henry McMaster. There are three things I'd like you to know about me. I'm a mother, I'm a wife, and I'm a business owner. My husband, David, and I started our company, Quality Business Solutions, 18 years ago. We are the back office resources for our clients across this country and right here in our home state. I have seen firsthand over those 18 years what high taxes and heavy regulation can do to stifle business. I want to take my fresh set of eyes and what I've learned during my time in business to Columbia and join the governor's winning team. You know, in his short time in office, not quite two years, he has announced over 23,000 new jobs and $8 billion in economic investment. Unemployment is at the lowest it's ever been here in South Carolina. The minute goes by quickly. It does, Doesn't thank it? you. <laughs> Representative Norell. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Andy, and thank you, SCETV. I'm Mandy Powers Norell, and I'm from Lancaster, a community that was devastated a decade ago when our textile mill closed. My, both of my parents worked for that mill, and I worked there too in order to pay for college. After law school, I returned to Lancaster with my wonderful husband, Mitch, to start a business and raise our family. Our children go to the same public schools that I attended. But now, as a bankruptcy lawyer, I'm filing bankruptcies for a lot of the people that I used to work side by side with at the mill. And when I hear Henry McMaster talk about how great our economy is, I know that he is ignoring people in places like Lancaster, and he is ignoring the fact that even those lucky enough to have a job are having to work twice as hard at sometimes two and three jobs, and they're only seeing their wages increase at half the rate of North Carolina. I'm running with James Smith because being 50th in education and 46th in wage growth and 44th in health care are not good enough, and we're going to fix it. Thank you. Uh, let me start with a question to both of you. I think we'd all in this state like to know a little bit more about each of you, and, and that minute did go by quickly. Uh, could you expand, for example, on how you were chosen, why you think you were chosen, how Governor McMaster and Representative Smith might have approached you? I'm rolling up several things together here. <laughs> but I know that in, in your case, uh, Ms. Evett, you really didn't appear to have known Governor McMaster all that long before he selected you to run with him. And in your case, you've worked with James Smith in the legislature. You may be two peas in a pod. There are <laughs> pros and cons to both of those things. So we'll start with you first, if, if we might, Ms. Narell. Okay, thank you, Charles. Well, I've known James Smith for 10 years. He, uh, he helped me in 2008 when I, uh, when I ran for South Carolina Senate. I was unsuccessful in that race, but he, uh, he sent people to uh, help me get organized and, uh, and learn how to run a campaign. I didn't know him at that point, but he believed in me and believed in my abilities. I have 20 years experience in municipal uh, government. I have 
attorney for the city of Lancaster and the town attorney for the town of Kershaw. So I have a lot of experience in local government. I have six years experience working in the South Carolina House of Representatives. James and I have worked together across the aisle to bridge the divide between Republicans and Democrats to get substantive bills passed, all the way from bills dealing with child abuse to bills dealing with solar and renewable energies. And he himself has, has been able to pass over 60 pieces of major legislation, all while being in the minority party. We share that in common, that we can bridge that gap and work across the aisle with Republicans in order to get things done. Thank you, and essentially the same question to you. How did you get to be part of this ticket and, and the relationship with, with uh, Mr. McMaster? Well, the governor and I met um, two years ago, almost two years ago now, and we instantly had had a connection. Um, I was, we were, we were, um, we were drawn together um, during the Donald Trump um, campaign. We had very like values, and the governor and I shared similar sentiments about how the state should should go, how we should be pro business. We should make it it attractive for businesses to want to come to South Carolina. Economic development is what helps drive an economy. We know that. We know the enemy of education is poverty. And the only way to stop poverty is through economic development. We shared those same ideals. And I was honored when the governor called me. I wasn't sure why he was making the phone call to me at the time. But I was very honored when he did ask me to be his running mate. Let me uh, start the second question with you, Ms. Abbott. Uh, at, at the debate last week, we asked both of the gubernatorial candidates uh, exactly what their running mates would be doing as lieutenant governor in a position that is now amorphous. You will set the, the marker uh, because it has changed from what the lieutenant governor used to do. Governor McMaster said, uh, touted your business experience. Uh, he said, she's an accountant, I'm a lawyer. We think that's a pretty good combination. But could you tell me then, how you're going to put this, how you're going to create this job, craft this job? Well, I'm excited to be an extension of the governor's office. I want to work with the legislature, many of them I've got to know really well during the primary and the primary runoff and now during the general election. I'm excited to work with them to break down the silos that seem to happen in Columbia, to make sure that programs are running efficiently, that we're spending the hard-earned money that the taxpayers of South Carolina are sending to Columbia, that we're spending it the best way possible. That's where I think my accounting background and my business experience. You know, my husband and I started our company from a startup company, and it was through efficiencies that we were able to grow to the size we are today. I want to take that to Columbia and be a fresh set of eyes and a fresh perspective on what's been happening down there to see how I can lend a hand helping the governor with what we feel is important, economic development. We know that will solve a lot of problems here in our state. Thank you. And, and Ms. Norell, uh, Representative Smith cited your legislative experience, uh, said that you could uh, start without a day of on-the-job training to move legislation through the House and Senate. Yes. A likelihood it's still going to be a Republican House and a Republican Senate, and you'd be a Democratic Lieutenant Governor. So how do you do that? Well, actually, that's quite easy. If you look at the, the way that the um, House and Senate overrode Henry McMaster's vetoes, many of which we spoke on and encouraged the, the chamber to override, you'll see that our, our relationships with fellow members of the General Assembly are much better than Henry McMaster's relationships with the General Assembly. I will, uh, I will work uh, across the aisle, just as James and I have both done throughout our, uh, our legislative careers, and, and we have built built coalitions. You know, there was uh, there have been points when when vetoes came up and I asked leadership, you know, do you need me to override this veto? I, one day I had a uh, an event with my daughter and they said, "Oh no, we're going to override this veto." And this was leadership. This was people in his own party. And and they are we are working together in the House and Senate now to um, w with colleagues and I'm going to be able to uh, to usher in usher legislation through the House and Senate to further our legislative agenda, I think much more effectively, and really party doesn't matter. Thank you. Andy Shane has the next set of questions. You'll start with a question to Ms. Uh, Powers and Rao. Yes. Okay. Well, we're sure you wouldn't be here unless you agreed a lot with your running mates. True. That said, I'm sure there are a few things where you don't necessarily agree with them. 
So first off to you, Representative Norell, where don't you agree with Representative Smith? I thought you might ask me this, and I've tried to think of places where we don't agree. I think that I, I actually could not think of any, even having anticipated that question. I, I do think that we have a, a diversity of experiences. We have, we see things from, from different perspectives. He's from Columbia and I'm from Lancaster. He's from a more urban part of the state and I'm from a more rural part of the state. So we bring different experiences together. He's been serving in state government for a- uh, there, there, there are no issues where you, where you slightly differ even- Do you, you have one in mind, Andy? Because no, well, I, I mean, don't, okay. I really don't. Okay. We've been working together to craft a, a legislative agenda and uh, I don't think that, that I can't think of a single one. Okay. Ms. Beck? All right, I thought you might ask this question too. And so I have come up on a point that the governor and I differ on. I'm a Clemson Tiger <laughs> and he's a South Carolina Gamecock, but I think together we really make a great ticket that represents everybody that is, a, there are football goers here in the state. Um, but all kidding aside, I mean, in business, I have always looked to craft a team that have different skill sets. As the governor pointed out in his debate, and, and I say all the time, I'm an accountant and the governor is a prosecutor. He is a man of law and a man of rule. And so we just look at things differently. We come to the same understanding, but we will attack a problem differently. And I think that's what's most important. Whether you're building a team in business or a team here in Columbia, well, you want to make are, sure. There are no issues. I you told did. you our issue. Mm -hmm. we, we do. We root well. for opposite <laughs> teams. This will be a ticket divided <laughs> here soon. So, you know, this could be, you know, in most households, this is a big issue. But like I said, all kidding aside, we really have like-minded issues. We really understand and we have the same direction. And I think that's where we will do so well together. You know, historically, you could have a Republican governor and a Democratic lieutenant governor, and you could run in different directions. But here, when you can pick your running mate, you can make sure that the ideas you have, you can craft together and do positive Thank things you. for the people of the state. Thank you. Andy's next question would be directed to Ms. Evett. Thank you. Um, You've already, of course, addressed a little bit about how you might deal with the legislature. But in, in, a, in a way, you come from different backgrounds. You're a, uh, Pamela, you're a, you're a newcomer to this. Um, Mandy, you're obviously someone who has been around politics for a while. What, is, what do you see the advantage that you have in being, in this, in your case, a newcomer? And obviously, what detriment does your, uh, your opponent have, obviously, in, in her case, being uh, someone who's been around the State House for a number of years? Well, I think anytime you bring a fresh perspective into something, you see things with new eyes, clearer eyes. Something that maybe the things you see every day, you know, as they say, the forest is in front of the trees. So, I mean, I think that is a huge advantage. Um, working with the legislature, I mean, I think the governor has done a great job. I mean, through, through the entire primary and primary runoff, people from the legislature, Democrats, Republicans, state, um, local governments, have come out and applauded the governor for his open door policy. The fact that he welcomes everybody and their opinions to come and sit down and talk with him, and he really listens. Well, how, how's your education been through all of this? I'm just trying to understand how things work in state government. Well, I, I, I think I'm doing well. I've sat down with a lot of people. I've sat down with Senator Sheely. I've sat down with the director of First Steps. I've done my homework. I've sat down with a lot of teachers and principals and met with businesses. I think collaboration is the key. I think it's a unique perspective because it's something I do every day in business, is collaborating, making sure when there's a problem or an issue, you bring the best and brightest to the table so you can do the, get the best results for the Thank people you. of our state. Thank you. Ms. Norrell. Thank you, Andy. You know, I always think it's so funny when people argue for the um, for inexperience as, as as equaling fresh ideas. You know, if you need to get your car worked on, are you going to go to somebody who's never worked on a car because they might have a fresh idea about how to fix your car? No, you're going to go to somebody who's worked on a car before because they're going to know how to do it. That's what experience is. I will have no on the job training because I've been working in government for over 20 years. I've been in the legislature for 
for the past six years, and I know how to get things done. But I do want to say that I am really glad that Governor McMaster chose an accountant to, um, as his running mate, because I think she can help him with some math that I heard in the last debate. He keeps bragging about these 23,000 new jobs that he's brought to South Carolina, but he doesn't subtract out the over 10,000 jobs that we have lost since he's been governor. And he also does not account for the fact that our population is growing at 1% a year. That's 50,000 people a year. That's 100,000 people who've come into this state and he's bragging about creating 23,000 jobs. Thank that you. is a deficit. Thank you. Let, let me ask a, a question of you in this manner. We've said that you'll be the first lieutenant governor elected on a ticket with the governor, but you won't be the first woman to serve as lieutenant governor. Nancy Stevenson served in the uh, Richard Riley administration. As lieutenant governor, Stevenson worked to gain South Carolina's ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment unsuccessfully, but she also worked to support victims of domestic violence, which is a significant problem for women in South Carolina. As a woman running on, on, uh, in this election, what would be your priorities in dealing with issues most of concern to women? We'll start with you, Ms. Narell. Thank you, Charles, and, and I'm glad that you brought up criminal domestic violence because South Carolina is sixth in the nation in terms of women killed by men. That's not winning. That's being on the top of a list we don't want to be on the top of. And every year, the Attorney General has a silent witness ceremony to recognize the victims of criminal domestic violence. This year, James Smith sat beside Henry McMaster's empty chair at the silent witness ceremony. He vetoed. Henry McMaster vetoed the funding to child advocacy centers, which are near and dear to my heart. So when you ask what I'm interested in, I'm interested in child abuse and preventing child abuse. And when he vetoed all of the money that the state was giving to child advocacy centers, which, do, which take children in who have been the victims of child sexual abuse and take care of them in a setting that is loving and, and nurturing, that's unconscionable. And thank goodness the legislature overrode that veto by a resounding margin. Thank you. Ms. Evett, the same, same question. What are your priorities with regard to issues of most concern to women? Well, let me tell you, domestic violence is something that we should all take very seriously. I am glad to be teamed up with our governor because when our governor was attorney general, he's the one that recognized that women that were um, a part of the domestic violence were not having their cases heard. He made sure he cleared the dockets. He deputized attorneys to come in and have their cases heard. He started the child predator division and he did that through federal funding money, nothing that came out of state funds. I will say another thing that I'm very proud of with our governor, and it's something that I've learned in business, is that you have to make sure that when you are granting money to people, that there is complete clarity in how that money is being spent. And as I looked at some of the vetoes that were, were put, that the governor vetoed and that were overturned, there was not clarity in a lot of that. We wanna make sure that all the money that's spent is being spent exactly what it needs to be spent on and that it's going for the right things. Thank you. Rebuttal, Charles. That was $10,000 per child advocacy center. There's not a lot you can spend that little amount of money on, but child advocacy centers stretch their budgets and live on a shoestring. And to tell them that they cannot have $10,000 a piece, we only have 17 child advocacy centers all over the state. Some children have to travel an hour or more to get the help that they need after they have been sexually abused. And to tell them they can't have $10,000 because you don't know exactly how they'll spend it on is unconscionable. Thank you. Do you well, want to respond to that? Yes. I mean, there are a lot of ways. I mean, the, it's the governor's responsibility to make sure that the hard-earned money that the taxpayers of South Carolina are sending to Columbia are being used the right way. We are a very generous people, and I personally support some of those child advocacy centers through my business, through charity, through works that we do. There are a lot of, the resources are not only coming from the government, and I believe that there are such great people, but when you are the government and you're the leader, sometimes you have to make hard choices, and you have to make sure that everybody and everything that's running across your desk 
is going for the right things. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm curious, question first for Ms. Evan and then for you. Do you two know each other at all, barely, hardly? We met one day in Georgetown. We did. <laughs> we, we met one day in Georgetown and, and, and just kind of in passing here on the trail a little bit. How do you feel about the two tickets gender balance? Do you think this is a coincidence? And more broadly, what's your view of diversity? Well, I, I think diversity is wonderful because diversity is how we can craft the best ideas that we come together. Because like I said earlier, everybody comes at things with different perspectives. You know, when I met Mandy in Georgetown, I, I said to her, um, the fact that I'm a woman is very apparent and it's not something that we, we really talked about much on our campaign and really we tried to, to stay away from because we wanted to concentrate on issues and qualifications and what we could bring to the ticket and not so much just our gender. Same question to you. Thank you, Charles. Um, in terms of gender balance and, and women in politics, you know, we don't have a lot of women in a political office in South Carolina. I was the, uh, the first female city attorney for the city of Lancaster. I was the first woman to be the town attorney for the town of Kershaw. And I was the first woman to represent my district in the House of Representatives. And, you know, I appreciate so much the trailblazing women who came before me, but I hope that my daughter and Pamela's daughter are able to grow up and, and come into being in a, uh, in a state where being the first female anything is no longer a thing. I want women in government and women in business to be so mundane that we don't even talk about it anymore. We need diversity. This is one way of getting diversity. There are many, many other avenues for it, but I, uh, I'm looking forward to having more women in politics. Andy Shane has the next set of questions, starting with a question to Ms. Norell. Well, let's talk about a top issue for many South Carolinians, health care. Ah. South Carolina ranks among the 15 states with the highest percentage of uninsured people under the age of 64, according to the Kaiser Family Foundation. And one out of five of the poor in our state have no health insurance. Mm -hmm. If we're not going to expand Medicaid, how do we improve health care in this state? Andy, we are going to expand Medicaid, and I am so excited about that because on day one, after James Smith is sworn in, he is going to accept the federal health care funds, and he is going to provide health care coverage for 300,000 South Carolinians who don't have it today. It will create 44,000 new jobs and, and inject $2 billion a year into our economy, and I couldn't be more excited about that. But, 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 you look like you're about to well, I am, I'm about you. to because the legislature may not fund it, and it may it may be basically DOA. Unfortunately, D, DOA. So what else? Are you, what else is? What else do you have in your, in your bag? The legislature will not have to fund it for the first several years, and then our citizens will be so accustomed to having health care coverage that the pressure will be so great to fund it. But even when funding is necessary, it will be a one to nine match. We'll only have to provide 10 percent of the funding in 2020. But for right now, we can do it with absolutely no cost to taxpayers. And once we create an entire healthcare economy with 44,000 jobs and are saving people's lives, then it's going to be a popular endeavor. And thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Abbott. Okay, so that, that right there is something that would scare every accountant that's sitting right here in the state of South Carolina, is the bill is coming and we'll figure out how to pay for it when it gets here. So, since from 2000 to 2018, Medicaid has increased in the budget of the legislature approximately $1.2 billion. And there's approximately six things the legislature focuses on. I mean, main chunks of money that they spend. And it's DSS, and it's DHEC, and it's roads, and it's higher education, it's education, and it's Medicaid. So when you're saying we'll find the funds, even if it's nine to one, you still have to find that money to fund it. And if you're not gonna take it away from one of the five programs that are already in place, where are you going to get the money? And it's something that James and Mandy haven't wanted to say. They're going to have to raise your tax dollars But, but to how do we improve health outcomes? How do we improve getting more people insured if we're not going to expand Medicaid? Well, taking medicine to the rural areas, because I think that's really what we're talking about, is how do we get, how do we get doctors? We need to get more nurse practitioners out there. 
we need to make sure that we use telemedicine. I mean, health outcomes, giving somebody an insurance card doesn't automatically make them a healthy person. So, you know, saying giving them insurance is going to all of a sudden make South Carolinians healthy, I don't see that. Andy, your next may question. I rebut that, you, please. You, you may, of course. This is our money. This is already money that we have paid to the federal government, and they are asking us if we want it back, and we are saying, no thank you, federal government. You can keep our money. That's like refusing your own income tax refund, and nobody does that because that would be stupid. But South Carolina has done some really stupid things in refusing our own money that could insure our citizens and take care of people who are now dying who will not die when we accept our own money back and Thank cover you. them with health care. Thank you, Andy. Your next question is to well. Ms. Evett. Do you want to go? Do you, do you want well, to you, you, you both had a rebuttal. Well, on no, that yeah, because that that is only half half of this equation is the fact that the federal government is going to give us money. The other half of that equation is we're going to have to come up with money to give back to them, and it's a bill that they will send us that we will have to pay. And what we're not saying is where are we going to get that money? Because if we're going to take that money away from education or higher education or infrastructure or DSS, we're going to have to take it away from them or we're going to have to raise people's taxes. And we already have some of the highest tax rates in the Southeast. Right. Okay, your next you. question. South Carolina ranks among the bottom 10 in poverty rate and house, average household income, according to the U.S. Census Bureau. How do you plan to help the poor or advocate to help the poor in the legislature? I think the best way we can advocate for the poor is to have economic development thriving in our state. By bringing good jobs into South Carolina, good paying jobs, that helps the poor. That helps with a lot of problems. You know, the governor ha had, has said this many times during his debate and on the road. You know, he sat down with the superintendent of one of the schools and what he hates called the corridor of shame and asked her what would happen if a business came to your city. And she said, she took off her glasses, threw them on, she said, it would change everything for us. Good quality jobs are what we need to help the poor. That is what's helping them, helping them up, making them feel good about themselves, letting them, giving them the advantage to spend their money the way they want to. Well, coming from the private sector, I mean, what, what, uh, what have you seen that's been effective at all? Well, we have to lower our taxes, that's for sure. We have to get business excited about here. I think Tim Scott's IIOA plan is wonderful because we're giving businesses an incentive to go into areas that they may not go into on their own. And when they do that, it helps everybody in that area. Thank you. Representative Nora. Thank you, Andy. You know, I hear this about uh, how we need to recruit businesses to our area, but it leaves out one very important aspect of, uh, of how we recruit those businesses to our area, and that is having a well-educated workforce prepared for the jobs that are here today and the jobs that are coming tomorrow. And I have not heard one thing from Henry McMaster about how he is going to invest in public education to make sure that our students and our families are prepared for today's jobs and the jobs of tomorrow. You know, James and I went to the uh, South Carolina Economic Developers Conference and we learned there that incentives and tax breaks are number four on the list of what they're looking for when they're looking for a place to locate. Number one on the list is a workforce ready to work and having the skills and the ability and the education to do that from the start, and we in South Carolina have failed our families and our workforce in doing that, and it's harder to recruit business when you don't have an educated workforce. Thank you. Well, I'd like to rebuttal that on behalf of the governor. Um, I have stood with um, him and heard him talk many times over how businesses come here because of the people, the people, the people of South Carolina. And what they like about South Carolina is the, the relationships they have with not only our colleges, but our technical colleges. We have some of the greatest technical colleges in the country, and our governor has championed that across the state. He's trying to bring awareness to the normal parent, the normal grandparent who thought going to technical school was somehow 
a step down because we've always wanted to push our children into a four-year college. He has championed that Thank for you. our technical program. Thank you. I want to stay on, the, on this subject of education uh, since it's come up here. Uh, you, you both live in small towns, Travelers Rest and, and, and Lancaster. What problems concern you there? Education always leaps to mind. Healthcare always leaps to mind, both of which you've talked about. Uh, so how might the issues be different in those towns that you, that you live in, work in, serve in, and, and how you, can you improve that? And we'll start with, with you, Ms. Durrell. Thank you, Charles. You know, your zip code should not determine the level of education that you get or the quality of education that you get. But we're seeing in a lot of our rural communities, kids don't have access to the magnet schools and the special uh, education opportunities, especially education in the arts that, that we see in the more urban areas. And, and James and I are committed to the notion that Every child in South Carolina deserves a high quality education and not the minimally adequate education that has been okay for so many in state government. You know, we have a teacher shortage. My children have gone to the same public schools that I went to. The difference is that when I went to those schools, Dick Riley was our governor, and Dick Riley was the original education governor. And our teachers felt valued, our students felt valued, and our families felt valued. We knew education was very important. Now we are having to, to cover the, the shortfall from the, from the state government by providing the basics like copy paper to our children's classrooms. Thank you. How are you gonna help those, the kinds of communities that you live in? Well. I am, I'm friends with a lot of the teachers that are in our community, and I've talked to teachers all around the state. Like I said, I've met with principals and teachers, and I've talked to Molly Spearman, and it, it's funny because you, you would think that, from what we hear, that it, pay is the number one reason for teacher shortage. But when you sit down with teachers, what they'll tell you, it's teacher burnout. It's the fact that they now have so much regulation put into their day to day. So I sat down with this wonderful principal and he made this great analogy that said, Pamela, when you were in school, this was your relationship with your teacher. Now, a child's relationship to their teacher is this spread apart. And in the middle are binders and paperwork and things they have to fill out. And, and a teacher sat down and said to me, I can't get back to finding creative ways to teach my kids because teaching is a passion. It's not a job. And so she said, if I could get rid of some of the paperwork that gets funneled in from Columbia where I could get back to teaching, she said, teacher burnout, Pamela, Thank is real. Thank Can you. I let, let me I agree with her so much on that. And however, it's I not have a not rebuttal. That's heard, an agreement, that's a rebuttal <laughs> because I have not heard her running mate, Governor McMaster, say one thing like that this entire time. The only thing I've heard him say about public education or about teachers is that he would like to arm teachers with weapons to protect their classrooms. Not anything about helping our students learn or our teachers teach. Ms. Evan, I'll let you respond to that. Yeah, I, uh, I've never, I've always heard our governor say that, that we have to have the best quality teachers in our room. I have heard him um, time and time again, but then again, I'm with him a lot more than Ms. Norell, and I'm sure she only is reading, unfortunately, the negative that's coming out of our camp, but, but that's, um, but you know, the governor is, he's, he's passionate about education. He realizes that what we want, what's gonna attract business, what's gonna make families, you know, happy and thriving is a good education. Um, education is not something that is only important on the Democratic side of the ticket. You know, Republicans think it's really important too, and we wanna do what we can do for our teachers. Thank you. I wanna move from K-12 education to higher education. At the last debate, Governor McMaster complained that South Carolina is educating too many out-of-staters. <laughs> You're from Ohio. What's your view on out-of-state students coming here to get an education? Well, I mean, what I've been hearing, and unfortunately, uh, my daughter stayed in school in-state, so I don't have a lot of, uh, of um, kind of bandwidth to help you with here on this, but from what I've been hearing from other parents is that what ends up happening is that because students are brought in from out-of-state, it makes it harder 
to get into college for in-state students. And a lot of that is due to the difference in tuition and some things that are done with scholarships. And so I think that's more of what the governor was saying. I think as far as higher education, I think good healthy competition for our colleges is good. You know, technical colleges that are thriving and robust will make our four-year colleges want to make sure they can attract a lot more of those students there too. So just like in business with anything, I think good healthy competition is, is probably the best thing any of us can have. Ms. Norrell, you went to a, to a private university. You went to Furman. I did. I went to Furman. Uh, how attuned are you to the needs of public universities that really carry the bulk yes. of education well, I, and higher education? I also went to the University of South Carolina. You went to law school. Yes, yes. And, uh, and I'm glad that Pamela could clarify what the governor was saying in that last debate because I was quite confused by it. That was a uh, uh, an answer he gave to an immigration question. He said, we have too many out-of-state students at the University of South Carolina. And, uh, and I would point out that those out-of-state students are paying out-of-state tuition, which is significantly higher than in-state tuition. And, and those are funds that the university needs because it has been underfunded for far too long by state government. And, and it's, uh, it's a problem in South Carolina. We have one of the highest tuition rates for our publicly supported colleges and universities of any state in the nation. And that is a priority of James and, and mine to, uh, to get back to a university system where kids can do like I did and actually go to work and pay for their own education if their parents can't afford it. Right now, that's not possible. Thank you. Andy Shane has the next set of questions, starting with uh, Ms. Norrell. Right. Thank you. At a prior debate, <clears throat> excuse me, at a prior debate, I asked the governor candidates about gun ownership after more than 125 guns was found at the home of the alleged Florence police shooter. Mm -hmm. Now over the weekend, we have the F Pittsburgh synagogue mass murder of 11, where the shooter used an AR-15 and three handguns. Do we need some form of, arm of gun control, more gun control in this state? You know, Andy, I, I remember that question and, uh, and the notion that someone having more than 100 guns in their house should be uh, somehow limited, and, and I don't think that you can limit the number of guns that a person owns. Uh, my heart goes out to the people who were killed in that synagogue. It's so reminiscent of that day in, in 2015 when we lost nine people worshiping at Mother Emanuel, and it's something that, you know, I think that the answer to this is you know, is, is with everyone and not just with government. We have to curb hate speech. We have to curb the way that we talk about people we disagree with. Because it's easy to see when, when it becomes commonplace that, that people are dehumanized in, uh, in the way that they're described, that someone who is mentally unstable with a gun will start shooting. And, you know, James and I have always stood with law enforcement to, to make sure that we close the Charleston loophole, that we don't allow AR-15s to be sold in Walmart, that we, um, you know, have strict uh, um, requirements for the um, for concealed weapons permit and that Thank we you. don't allow permitless carry. Thank you. So I think we have gun laws on the books. I think we need to make sure we enforce them. I think one thing we have to do is we have to concentrate on mental health. We have to address that as a problem. The other thing I think we have to do, because we've seen time and time again, and like Mandy, it, it does break my heart every time we have a needless killing anywhere in our country. Um, but what we need to do is we need to now make sure if we see something, we say something. Because so many times we find after the fact when we have a killing like this, that there were warning signs all over social media. So, I mean, we need to encourage people, just like we do in airports. If you see something that looks wrong, say something, because maybe then we can stop some of these things from happening also. All right. Uh, my next question, I'm going to come back to K through 12, um, because I, I want to come back and get some spe some specifics from you, if I could. I just want to you know, obviously remind you that, of course, we're suffering in the national rankings. We currently have three school districts under state control at this moment. That's a, a high since we've had. You know, we've, I heard a lot about teacher regulations, um, but ex exactly what is it that we need to do to fix education, to make sure that our students are prepared in your, as you've said, Miss um, Yvette, you know, for these jobs of the future, what do we need to do exactly? Uh, do you feel like you would want to push in the legislature? Well, 
I, I think it kind of goes back to what I was saying. If we could free up teachers to actually teach and creatively teach and dynamically teach because they're not worried about the paperwork that they have to fill out, I think that makes for better outcomes. Is there anything else that you would recommend? Well, and, and for school districts that aren't, aren't performing because they're small or they should be consolidated. I think talking to Molly Spearman, that's something that she's looking at. When school districts are not doing well, bringing them together, using their resources that they would use you know, for two separate school boards, things like that, overhead expenses, and try to push that down to the student level. Okay. Ms. Norrell. Well, you know, a court decision determined that South Carolina's uh, standard for education was minimally adequate. We have fought that, James and I have fought that, that determination over and over. You know, but every single year the state adopts a law that will fund our schools at what is determined to be less than the statutorily required minimum. So that, by definition, is less than minimally adequate. That is failing our students and failing our teachers. I agree that we need to lift regulations on teachers, have an administrator who handles the administration of a classroom so that the teachers can teach and the children can learn, and do th innovative programs like team teaching and, and looping and, and the kinds of things where, where younger teachers learn from older teachers and more experienced teachers because we've got to give back the love of teaching to teachers so that we can retain them. But if, but if you're elected, how do you get the Republican-controlled legislature to do what it, as you say, it hasn't done. Because we have relationships in, in the Republican-controlled legislature. In fact, when, uh, when session ended this time, several in leadership came to us and said, when you win, bring us a plan for public education because we are ready to work on it. That's not something that I've heard from Henry McMaster. I have not seen a single plan for public education I, from him, I, and I I've you. looked. Um, I'm, Andy asked a question about guns as related to the violence that we've seen. I, I want to stay a little more focused on the environment. What in your view, and we'll start with, with you, Ms. Norrell, mm -hmm. what constitutes hate speech and what role do you see it playing in the political arena today? Thank you, Charles. Uh, James has, has introduced hate crimes legislation that would increase penalties for those who commit crimes based on hate and 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 this is the kind of thing that that would be um, that would be dealt with under that but attacking it on the front end we have the issue of hate speech and that is something that is is somewhat subjective but I think everybody knows it when they see it it's the kind of speech that dehumanizes another person based on their race based on their ethnicity uh, based on their gender or based on their sexual orientation it is when we permit people, especially people in leadership, we have a special obligation as people in leadership to not allow hate speech, to not tolerate it, and certainly to not engage in it, as I have heard from so many in leadership lately, that they will actually engage in hate speech. That dehumanizes other people, and when you dehumanize a person, it's easy to see how violence can erupt from mentally unstable people hearing that speech. Thank you very much, Ms. Levitt. Same question. I agree. I, I agree. We have to set the we have to set the example. You know, I don't agree with a lot of the direction that James and Mandy would like to stay the state in. You know, we have very different opinions and very different views on that. But there in no way do I look at Ms. Norrell as my enemy. We are just two people that have different ideas about how to run a state. And I think we have to be vigilant. We, we all know what hate speech is. We all know when we read something and it makes us cringe on the inside, that's hate speech. That's what I was talking about earlier. That's when we have to see it, we have to bring it to people's attention, and we have to call it out. Ms. Evett, in your view, is, is President Trump responsible for any of this climate in terms of the, the tenor of the discussion in the political en uh, engagement? Um, I believe there is, there is enough of that on both sides that we could probably talk about, but I don't think we should ever blame somebody. You know, I sat in church on Sunday and I heard from the pulpit that you, you can't transfer the sins of one person to another person, and that's not what we should be doing. 
People have to take accountability for their own actions, and those are the actions of that person. And I know that when people do bad things, they will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law here in the U.S. Mr. Rowell, I have a slightly different question for you. The Democratic Party is as riven as the Republican Party seems to be. Uh, and and you know, there, there are odds bet between different wings of your party. How do you, how do you resolve that? How do you get the, the bitterness out of either of these parties? Actually, I, uh, you've stated that as if I agree with you, Charles, and I don't necessarily agree with you because within, uh, when I go to meetings, I pull up and I see coexist bumper stickers on cars and I see that, you know, and I hear from people who, who want to welcome in people of all races and people of all religions and people of all, um, all ethnicities and beliefs. And that is something that I'm quite proud of. And you know, I strongly believe that leaders have an obligation to call out any time that they hear such divisive and dehumanizing words coming from anyone within their party or within their, their sphere of influence because we all have an obligation to recognize that the people who are our opponents are not our enemies and they are not evil. They are just people we happen to disagree with. And you think there are no factions in the Democratic Party? There are factions. If we, if we just think back to the last election, we happen to disagree with, but not factions that use dehumanizing speech toward others. Andy Shane has the next set of questions, and, and they will start with Ms. Norell. All right. Governor McMaster has said that we're winning in South Carolina. Uh, that we, obviously, he often talks about how we have more jobs and more economic development. Representative Smith says we're not, and he says if, Henry, if uh, Governor McMaster were a football coach, he would be fired for the low rankings that we have in education, health care, and other issues. I want to reverse this a little bit. So what is going well in the state of South Carolina, Representative Norrell? What is going well in the state of South Carolina? You know, South Carolina is one of the most beautiful states, probably the most beautiful state in the nation. And, you know, and we fight every day to make sure that we remain one of the most beautiful states in the nation. We fight against offshore drilling and we fight against those who would, uh, who would destroy our environment because all we have to do, if we lose that battle one time, things are destroyed. We have to continue to fight that battle. And, and it is one of the places that, that people really, really want to come to. I mean, obviously, Ms. Evett came from Ohio and, and there are many people who are coming here because it is a beautiful, beautiful state. We're growing at a terrific rate and, and we have the challenges that come with that growth. But it's a, uh, there are a lot of things that we could stand to improve and I totally disagree with uh, Governor McMaster. You heard my math earlier, 23,000 jobs with 100,000 people coming in and not subtracting out the jobs we've lost since he's been governor is not winning. Well, again, reversing it again with the idea that Governor McMaster says we're winning. Well, maybe there's some things we're not winning at. What are some of those things? Well, you know, I've always been a glass is half full kind of person. And let me tell you why. When you're the governor and the lieutenant governor in a state, you need to be the best cheerleader that you can be, and you need to be the best leader you can be. And how does it look when a governor of a state stands up and tries to rip apart everything that's going well in your state. When I sit down with people, people seem to be very happy in the state of South Carolina. They have jobs, unemployment is the lowest it's been. So why talk about what things are going wrong? I say let's focus on what's going good. Increasing economic development will help with all the other challenges we have in our state. So let's focus on that. Let's keep people excited. Let's keep business excited about coming to South Carolina because that's what's going to continue to put us on the map. So the only thing we need to fix is our attitude? Well, I mean, that's one good way of putting it, Andy. I think we should all look at things and, and, and be positive about them. I can't, I can't eat an number. attitude. I can't be taught by an attitude. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. I mean, I've asked about the poor before. I mean, obviously, one out of, you know, one out of five South Carolinians don't have health insurance. An attitude isn't going to get them health insurance. No, but a good-paying job is definitely going to help them, and that's what we're striving for. Okay. Oh my goodness! I, so I think what I just heard was that we just need to say it's good, and it will be good, or people will think it's good. But when we talk about 
when they talk about adding 23,000 jobs but not subtracting out the jobs that we've lost or recognizing that we've grown at the rate of 100,000 since he came into office, that is just sticking your head in the sand and pretending things are okay when they are really not. The Bureau of Labor Statistics has shown that our labor participation rate in South Carolina is the third worst in the nation. That is not okay. winning. But I would say that in six years in the State House, what has really been, what has progressed from your agenda, considering again that you're the minority party and you will be, and if you win, you'll be facing a majority legislature, Republican, excuse me, majority Republican legislature, really. Right, and I've told you, Henry McMaster hasn't gotten anything done in that majority Republican legislature just because he's a Republican. It's not about partisanship, it's about relationships. And James Smith and I have the relationships in the General Assembly to get things done. Okay, so, so something I like to point out. It was a point I made earlier. So, Mr. Rowell has now said that she wants to go out and grab the Obamacare expansion and bring it here to South Carolina. And I, I said, you know, how do we fund that? And I explained that, and, and I know she knows that because she has been in the legislature for six years. James has been in 22. There's six really big ticket items that we fund. Later in our conversation, she said that they're gonna bring down the price of colleges. Higher education is one in those six. So if we're gonna expand Obamacare and we're gonna lower the you know college tuitions okay we're talking about our six things that we talked about where is this money coming from because when you have to raise taxes and businesses leave the state we already have some of the highest taxes in the southeast then what is going to solve our problem? I'd like to hear Ms. Norell's answer yeah, to that. We won't raise taxes. We have not proposed a single tax increase this entire campaign. And the truth is, we can't raise taxes. Any tax that has ever been passed during our tenure in the legislature has been a Republican-sponsored tax, such as the, uh, the roads bill, which improved our roads and was largely paid by out-of-state travelers. Okay, but the money has to come from somewhere. This is where the accountant in me goes back to the bottom line. You have to get the money from somewhere. Kind of like Ms. Norrell said, you can't just wish it to come to you, right? You can't just wish the money to fall into Columbia. The money has to come from somewhere. And if it doesn't come from something that you're already funding, it's got to come from tax dollars. Let me ask the question this way. And, and it's somewhat responsive to you, but I'd like both of you to respond to it. It's pretty much, and I've heard the governor say this, uh, and I've heard President Trump say that, that if you cut taxes, you raise revenues because you expand businesses. Is there a flaw in that logic? Well, if we look back at governors, uh, governors that have cut taxes, look at states that have no state tax and how they're flourishing. So if there's a flaw, I've yet to see it. When Reagan cut taxes, the economy did great. The president has cut taxes. We've seen what the stock market has done. We've seen how business has, has thrived. We've seen how more money has come back into the pockets of the working class. Because when business has more money to give back, they will. I know this firsthand. I deal with the back office, office of businesses across the country and here in the state. And when they had the benefit of some tax cuts, they gave bonuses out to their employees. They offered more into their 401k plans. They made their lives better. Ms. Norrell, where's the money going to come from? The notion of cutting taxes is a, is a really nice platitude, but it's a really vague statement. You know, what taxes are we talking about? Are we talking about property taxes or sales taxes or income taxes? And very often when state government cuts taxes, what they're doing ultimately is sending local government an unfunded mandate. And local government then has to raise taxes in order to, to fund the, uh, the, their own programs that they were otherwise getting state funds to, to take care of. And so as a general citizen, you don't see your bottom line going down. You're just paying more to local government than you did to state government. We saw that happen with Act 388. Local government ended up having to raise taxes in order to, uh, to take care of their citizens. And and the average citizen's tax bill didn't really go down, it went up. I, I've got a quick question before I turn it back to Andy for the, for the last question. Do you want to be governor? Start with you. I am prepared to be governor. 
but that was not my motivation in accepting. Do you want to be governor? No, I'm prepared to be governor if that need is called on me to do, but I'm, I am happy to come in as lieutenant governor and work with our governor and use what I can bring from my business background and help South Carolina grow. Andy, your question. I'm very good. One, I want to go back to one of your earlier answers when I asked about guns and also from the discussion that we had about hate speech. It sounded like that you're saying that it's more important that we don't take away any guns, but we can regulate hate speech. Is that what I'm, is that, I mean, is basically the Second Amendment more important than the First Amendment no, in this case? No, I'm not suggesting we regulate hate speech. I'm suggesting that we as leaders have an obligation to call it out. You know, in uh, 2015, when we took down the Confederate flag, one of my uh, colleagues, Republican colleague, Doug Brannon, said something that I'll never forget. He said, I always knew it should come down, but it took my buddy dying to give me the courage to do what I knew I should have done all along. And he followed that up by saying, I should be ashamed of myself. And after that, I just thought any time that I hear something or see something that is not good for my fellow man, that, that I know is the right thing to do, I'm gonna have to do it, even if it's uncomfortable and, uh, and even if it hurts or makes me uh, uneasy in the moment, because you have to do the right thing to do, even uh, so that you won't be ashamed of yourself later on. Ms. Yes, I, I don't believe you can, you can censor hate speech, but you can call it out. And I think when, when we have more people that call out bad behavior, call out hate speech, when we have it turned over to law enforcement and more people are prosecuted, I think it will start to set a tone for what people will be willing to put in print and say out loud. Thank you both, and thank you as well. We've squeezed every second out of this. I've got 15 seconds to say thank you, especially to, to both of our candidates for being with us this evening. Thanks to my colleague, Andy Shane of the Post and Courier. Election day is Tuesday, November 6th. On election evening, we will be here in the SCE TV studios with results and analysis. We hope you will tune in at 8 p.m. For everyone at SCE TV, thank you. Good evening. I'm Charles Beerbatt.